before we can talk about Juneteenth, we kind of need to take a step back and talk about why it exists, why we have it, and just a little bit of the history behind why it even exists. So as most people know, um, on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed uh, enslaved people who were located in Confederate states. So in other words, the South. Um, Although technically slave, slavery was over, enslaved people in Texas, they weren't notified that they were free until June 19th, 1865, which was more than two years later. Uh, scholar Henry Louis Gates, who you guys might know uh, from the show Finding Your Roots on PBS, he does a lot of ancestry uh, research on famous people. Um, he wrote that on plantations, Masters had to decide when and how to announce the news or wait for a government agent to arrive. And it was not uncommon for them to delay until after the harvest. In 1865, there were more than 250,000 enslaved black people just in Texas. And a year later, Juneteenth celebrations started popping up. So this one is from Columbus in Ohio. Um, and you can see where it says the Negroes celebrate the seventh anniversary of emancipation today. And between 1,500 and 2,000 people were present. This next one is from Eaton. And so this is uh, in 1881. This one falls in September, but they were still having emancipation celebrations. And so I thought that was pretty cool to note uh, that they were bringing speakers in um, from Tennessee to celebrate emancipation. This next one is from Cors Corsicana, and this is from 1883. And you can see that at this point, 5,000 people were able to participate in the celebration of Emancipation Day. So hopefully I'm conveying that this is a pretty big deal and it just started growing and growing. Um, by 1900, this one is in Austin, and so uh, the newspaper noted that it would be observed by the colored population of Austin and Travis County. It goes on to say that there would be two celebrations, there would be a parade, and so there will also be picnics because, you know, with every celebration, you absolutely have to have food. In 1872, a group of African-American ministers and businessmen, and here's a photo of, of some of them from 1872, they purchased 10 acres of land in Texas and created Emancipation Park, which is still there today. And it was intended to hold the city's annual Juneteenth celebration. As of 2021, so we're fast forward in quite a few years, Juneteenth is now considered a national holiday, and it would not be possible if it were not for this woman, Opal Lee. Um, in 2016, Opal Lee, she's known as the grandmother of Juneteenth. She was 89 years old, and she began a walking campaign from her home in Fort Worth, Texas, to Washington, D.C., to draw attention to the day's importance. Although it took six years of her walking and petitioning Congress and petitioning the White House, her efforts prevailed. And finally, on June 17th, 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. And so this photo here is, he, as you know, when the president signs a, uh, a bill into law, he uses a pen for each one of his, one of the letters in his name. And the first pen that he, uh, after he signed his name, he sent that to, or gave that to Opal Lee. So that's really cool. Over the years, the holiday spread throughout Texas and beyond, and celebrations now include rodeos. This is uh, the, the um, Bill Pocket Rodeo down Texas, different festivals. This festival is actually in Germantown in Pennsylvania, and Miss Juneteenth festivals. But whatever the method of celebrating, whether it was hundreds of years ago or present day, every single event shares one critical component, and that's food. There are staple dishes that grace tables every year. It doesn't matter if it's in Pennsylvania, it doesn't matter if it's in Colorado, California, Texas, there are some staple foods. In 1933, the Dallas Morning News reported, quote, watermelon barbecue and red lemonade will be consumed in quantity. 
Uh, Michael Tway, who wrote, uh, and you might have heard of this book, The Cooking Gene, which is an excellent book that if you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend. He wrote, quote, the practice of eating red foods, red cake, barbecue, punch, and fruit may owe its, may owe its existence to the enslaved Yoruba and Congo brought to Texas in the 19th century from present day Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, Benin, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo. So you'll see a theme in a lot of these suits, not all of them, but in a lot of them, that there's a significance to the color red. The first one, you know, these are some celebratory foods. Uh, this was taken from a Juneteenth celebration in Dallas. And so their festival foods include uh, you know, funnel cake, a turkey leg, but we'll get into more specific foods in just a second. And we'll start with watermelon. And this obviously is a photo of watermelon seeds. Uh, watermelons, they originate in Africa. They were cultivated extensive, extensively in the American South, and there are countless varieties. And one of my favorite varieties is the moon and stars, which you'll see here, uh, watermelon. It's probably the most famous heirloom watermelon of all time. It was grown nationwide in the 1900s and was actually lost in the 1980s. And then a, a farmer actually found, uh, found someone growing them in the middle of Missouri of all, of all places. If you look at them, they're oblong. They're not round watermelons at all. They almost kind of look like massive cucumbers if you're looking at them. And so they have a dark green rind. And if you can look to, let's see in the picture to my left, you can see on the top here, this watermelon with a big round circle on it, big yellow circle, and that's the moon. Um, and they're also speckled with other yellow dots on them. And so those are the stars. And so these are very tasty watermelons. If you guys can, you know, get your hands on these or see them in any farmer's markets or anything like, anything like that, I highly, highly recommend you guys grab one of these. This next one uh, is called an Odell's White. And this one's really, really interesting. It's notable, not because it's an heirloom watermelon, although that is important, but this watermelon is the only cultivated watermelon that can be attributed to an enslaved man. Uh, his name was Harry and he worked on watermelons on a plantation in Sumter, Sumter, South Carolina. And as you guys are probably aware, a lot of the activities of enslaved people were not necessarily written down, much less their names. That's a, that is a very rare occasion, uh, but there were pomologists, his owner was a pomologist um, and studied fruits and, and vegetables and you know, trusted Harry with creating this particular version of watermelon. And so there are a few places that you can get today, not, not very many, but you know, I always wanna talk about that because it literally is the only one attributed to an enslaved person. This guy right here, this is Joshua Fitzwater. He's actually my partner. And so he actually grew uh, the red and sweet watermelon, which he's holding in his hand. Uh, this is super special because not just because he grew them, although that's important, uh, but two years ago, this watermelon that he's holding could not be found outside you know, of a small town in Louisiana, a town called Monroe. That was the only place you could have found it. And so uh, Joshua and I, we actually drove from Virginia to Louisiana uh, to try it out because we, we found out about it on Facebook of all places. Um, and after we tasted it, he decided to save the seeds and see if, the, if we could grow them here in Virginia. And so it, it was a success, we were able to do it. If you look at the flesh of this watermelon, it's insanely red. It is probably the reddest watermelon I've ever seen. And the name of the watermelon obviously is very appropriate. It's called wet, Red and Sweet, but he was able to harvest about a hundred of these watermelons. Um, and he was able to save seeds from about half of them. And you know, growers from all over the country have bought them. And it's a beautiful thing because really we've brought something back um, you know, to the rest of the country and it wasn't there before. So you see a red and sweet, absolutely try and get those because now you might be able to find them in different places in the country. This illustration, uh, we're gonna move on to fried chicken. Um, perhaps the most notable women um, when it comes to fried chicken are these women called the Gordonsville water kit, excuse me, waiter carriers. Um, this Gordonsville is a town outside of Charlottesville. I don't know how familiar you guys 
are with Virginia, but it's right outside of Charlottesville. And it was called the Fried Chicken Capital of the World in 1869 uh, by writer George Bagby. Um, in 1862, during the Civil War, the Army of Northern Virginia transformed a hotel that was near the train stop into a hospital. And during this time, these women, these formerly enslaved women, they served thousands of soldiers who stopped through the town. Um, and there was a train, and so it was, it was a prominent stop, basically, when you were coming from New York to the deeper south. And so when the train stopped at the station, Black women would walk up to the train and you would smell the, you know, fried chicken and you would smell biscuits and the other baked goods. And so they were able to sell these, these uh, baked goods and the fried chicken to people on the train. And so if you can imagine it's hot, you've been traveling on this train for a really long time and you smell this incredible food um, because there were few jobs that were available at that time to black women. This was really a, a, a great way for them to utilize their skills to you know, basically provide for their families after the Civil War. I think this is probably a better photograph um, of, of these women. This is from you know, early 1900s, late 18, 1800s. And so as you can see, they're holding up the basket to, to pass in the, to the train window for the food there. And actually, I'm skipping a bit ahead, I apologize. Um, in 1871, the CNO Railroad, they sent newspaper writers to the South, and this is how they described the scene. Quote, we were surrounded with a swarm of old and young Negroes carrying large servers upon their heads, containing pies, cakes, chickens, boiled eggs, strawberries and cream, ripe cherries, oranges, tea and coffee, biscuit sandwiches, fried it, it, ham and eggs and other edibles, which they offered for sale. Unfortunately, with the introduction of dining cars and air conditioning that happened in the early 1900s, the, the windows were permanently closed on trains at that point. And so waiter carriers were unfortunately um, phased out. There is still a fried chicken festival that happens every year in Gordonsville to, to mark these women. And there's an actual um, marker, a state marker that lists it as a historic place, but sadly the way your carriers are no longer in, and for a period of about 10, 15 years, they were able to be successful. This is an illustration of barbecue. Barbecue is another one of those foods that's going to be really important to the Juneteenth table. Um, American barbecue is a mix of contributions from Native Americans, European settlers, Africans and early African Americans. So this was happening in Virginia and American barbecue as we know it uh, actually starts here in Virginia. I'm not saying that because this is where I'm from. Uh, all of the, the history and all of the documentation points to that. Um, as early as the 17th century, barbecue meats were common at Virginia gatherings. That would have been hogs, it would have been squirrel, venison, oxen, fish, Basically, any kind of protein would have been, would have been prepared. Um, in 1790, nearly half of all enslaved African Americans lived in Virginia. But by the time of the Civil War, that figure shrunk to 12%. And so as they were moved throughout the, the wider South and the deeper South, they, were, they carried their barbecue traditions with them, which essentially is how we get barbecue throughout the South and then later through the Great Migration to the North and to the West. By the mid 18th century, the word barbecue was synonymous with a gathering that included meats over coals. And as you can see in this particular photo, it was a massive undertaking to take on, to put on a barbecue for a crowd. You can see how many men are working. They have the, the pit already dug. They haven't put the meat on yet, it doesn't appear, but there's you know, 10, 15 guys there who are going to be in charge of making sure that the meat is properly cooked. And so you can imagine this would have been a really, really big, big gathering. The next food that's pretty traditional uh, that you'll find on a Juneteenth uh, table is macaroni and cheese. And so baked macaroni and cheese as we know it today was brought to this country by America's first chef de cuisine. And his name was James Hemmings who was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. You might be familiar with his sister, Sally Hemings, uh, who had several of, of Jefferson's children. Um, when Jefferson was ambassador to France, he took Sally and James with him and 
The sole reason James went to, to Paris was to learn to cook French cuisine for Jefferson. He was there for about three years. He became fluent in French and he brought back many dishes that we still eat today, including ice cream, creme brulee, whipped cream, and obviously the American staple that we all know and love, um, macaroni and cheese. I thought this would be really cool to show you guys. I'm always so interested in this. This is the only document that's left uh, in Hemming's hand. He wrote this. It's an inventory of kitchen utensils. Unfortunately, we don't have his recipes written down um, in his hand, but beautiful penmanship. Clearly, he was he was literate, but this is this is just a really special document. And this kitchen largely looks the same as it would have when Hemings was, kitchen, was cooking there. Uh, this is the kitchen at Monticello. If you notice the stove in the left-hand corner, you see the different holes, kind of rectangular holes cut out uh, on the platform. Uh, that is a stew stove. And Jefferson had this brought over from France. And at the time, this was considered advanced technology because this was a way to cook multiple things at the same time, but with varying degrees of heat. So it's very similar to what we know today as a modern stove, but, you know, but this is what would have been you know, high tech, if you will, um, at the time. It's pretty extraordinary. Obviously, you guys all know this one. This will be a sweet potato pie. Uh, Spanish traders brought sweet, potato, sweet potatoes worldwide in the 1600s, including to West Africa. Um, West Africans were accustomed to the textures and flavors of their native tubers, such as the yam, and they weren't big fans of the sweet potato when it was first introduced into Africa. Um, however, when enslaved people were in America, sweet potatoes grew very well in the South because it's so hot here. Um, and it was similar enough to yams that they knew how to prepare them. And so if you ever hear candy yams on a menu. Obviously they're not actual yams. You, you don't often find yams here in America, um, but they just, the term became interchangeable. Yams and sweet potatoes essentially morphed into the same thing. And so what we know as sweet potato pie was made for enslavers, um, but African-Americans, they created an, a crustless sweet potato dessert that they could fix um, in, their, in their cabins. And it was molasses and spices along with the sweet potatoes cooked in a hearth, but there was, there was no crust. They didn't have the ingredients uh, available to them to make a crust. This one is going to be super controversial uh, because if you don't make this right, if you do not make this potato salad right, you will be banned from every family gathering. It just will not happen. They will tell you to bring a bag of ice instead of bringing something here. So potato salad clearly is popular all over the world. Um, in Southern Germany, as you might know, it's prepared with vinegar and oil, mustard, maybe some bacon bits. Um, in Sicily and Italy, it's made with string beans and red onions and tossed with olive oil and vinegar. But in the South, which is this photo uh, here, um, and for my grandmother specifically, she's using a mayonnaise, yellow mustard, celery seed, chopped pickles, maybe relish, and hard boiled eggs. So that's kind of the Southern style of, of potato salad. And author Adrian Miller wrote, quote, there's a German origin connected to the side dish, but some also some connections to slavery. And he said that it was the German Im immigrants who taught the, brought the recipe over to the United States. Miller's explanation for how potato salad became a popular staple in the black community made sense considering the German migration that took place in the South during the 1860s. In a 2008 article, Jeffrey Strickland examined how German immigrants were, quote, a middleman minority community in most Southern states between 1860 to 1880. And so there was a sharing of recipes that went back and forth. And originally this was actually called coleslaw. Um, but now we call it potato salad, but it became an extremely popular Southern dish in many black families. This is a red velvet cake. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the color red symbolizes joy, which explains its use as a celebration cake today in black communities. Many experts consider the cake to have origins 
uh, from 1911 when Rufus Estes, he was a formerly enslaved person and chef, he incorporated a recipe for sweet velvet cake in his cookbook, uh, which you see here. You can actually still buy this today. It's on Amazon and in different, uh, in different thrift stores. It's really a cool cookbook. Um, but the infusion of the color red into these cakes, that's a much more recent innovation. Uh, red velvet cake in particular was only introduced in the 1930s when red food dye was developed. And since that point, that's when red velvet cake became a part of African-American home cooking. A little bit about Estes. Uh, at age 26, he was employed by the Pullman Company, uh, which was founded in 1867 by George Pullman. Uh, this company built and operated luxury rail cars that contained parlors, dining rooms, and sleeping chambers. And Pullman employed many former slaves as porters and chefs. And there was a phrase at the time that said, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves and George Pullman hired them. Um, a job on a Pullman car, it offered decent wages, stay employment, but it really was an opportunity for a lot of people to see the United States because the train route went, uh, went coast to coast. Pullman porters were exclusively black until the mid 20th century, as were most of the company's maids, chefs, and waiters. Um, I, obviously, in contrast, the conductors, they were white. Uh, but back to Essie's, his talents as a chef quickly made him a star in the Pullman line. From 1883 to, to 1897, he perfected his craft. He served three meals a day to many of the Victorian era's most famous luminaries on private cars that ferried them around the country. And in his cookbook, he wrote, quote, I was selected to handle all special parties. Among the distinguished people who traveled in my care were Stanley, the African explorer, President Cleveland, President Harrison, Adelina Patty, the noted singer of the world. And in 1894, I set sail from Vancouver on, with the Empress of China and Mr. and Mrs. Nathan A. Baldwin for Japan, visiting the Cherry Blossom Fe Festival in Tokyo. In 1897, Mr. Arthur Stilwell, at that time president of the Kansas City, Pittsburgh and Gold Railroad, gave me charge of his magnificent $20,000 private car. These, this is an example of Pullman porters. Uh, they had starch uniforms. They were easily identified by their trademark hat, which they wore the entire time that Pullman cars uh, were, were in vogue. And so you have to take a minute, if you can see in this photo here, these men were incredibly talented. You can see how small the kitchen area was and they were creating extravagant meals. We're not talking hamburgers and hot dogs that you have on the on Amtrak today. There was no microwave. So they are creating, you know, duck a la range. They are creating stews and soups and bisque and you know other protein meats. They're creating all of this from this tiny little space, which I think was something like 30, you know, 30 by 30, if that. Um, but yeah, it's an incredibly tiny kitchen. And so they had to be a genius because you're on a train, you can't have every possible ingredient available to you. And so they need to be able to substitute ingredients in and out. So, so it just really, really hats off to them. But back to why the cake took on a red color. So when foods were rationed in the United States during World War II, bakers used boiled beet juices to enhance the color of their cakes and for sweetness. And so beets were also used in some recipes as a filler or to retain moisture. And so this really is, is part of where, it, you know, the, the red velvet cake gains its popularity. The frosting I thought was actually pretty unique to talk about the frosting as well. This is called an ermine frosting. And so it's the traditional frosting for red velvet cake. And it's also known, known as boiled milk frosting or cooked flour frosting. It's made by cooking flour and milk until it becomes a thick paste. Uh, the cooked milk, cu milk mixture is then beaten with butter. It's far less sweet than the buttercream icing and the texture is much more similar to a whipped cream. Um, traditionally, and I'll add this, the traditional recipes for, uh, for red velvet cake don't use a food coloring. They either use beets, um, if, if they're, they're being super traditional to World War II, 
or they use a non-Dutch cocoa, which I actually uh, just found out a couple months ago what non-Dutch cocoa is, and that's a cocoa solid that's been treated with an agent to reduce the natural acidity of cocoa, so it has less bitter taste and it changes the color of the ingredients that, that are in, you know, whether it's a cake or cookies or what, whatever that thing is. I highly recommend if you guys, you know, are, are interested in any of these foods and other kind of soul foods, whether it's biscuits or collard greens or anything like that, I would highly recommend this book by Adrian Miller. It's called uh, Soul Food. The Surprising Story of American Cuisine One Play at a Time. It's, it's an incredible read, very easy to read, very conversational, and we you know, highly recommend that. And also there's actually one cookbook that's, uh, that's in existence that's just dedicated to Juneteenth, uh, Nicole A. Taylor, Watermelon and Red Birds. It came out, I believe last year actually, so it's pretty new. She takes a lot of recipes that are traditional and a lot of um, ingredients that are very traditional and turns it on their ear. And so it really makes unexpected and new dishes and drinks. So also that's a recommendation for you guys. Um, we also, also talk about this um, in Setting the Table. This is a podcast that, that I've done. There are 10 episodes out wherever you get podcasts. Um, if you're also interested in learning more about how really African-Americans set the tone for much of American food and cuisine that we know today. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, please, I, I hope that, that, that you guys have some questions for me. Uh, I just, you mentioned the difference between yams and sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. Where do yams originally come from? You mentioned Africa. Yes. Yams are, yeah, because you speak up a little, I think you were asking where yams came from. Is that what you were? I never knew the difference. I just uh, thought interchangeably, they were interchangeable, just the way we said them. You were mentioning that yams are specifically from Africa. Yes, yes. Yams are specifically from Africa. And so the texture of a yam is going to be a little, um, it's a little thicker than the sweet potato. It, they're cooked pretty much the same over a fire and, and you know, you can add butter to them, you can roast them, um, but essentially it's, they're very similar. They look the same, except yams are much bigger and they're much starchier. So that's the, that's the main difference between the two. But yeah, people use them interchangeably, but yams are not found here. Um, and so people just automatically assume, I think I did until I started writing about black food. Um, I think that I had just assumed it was the same thing, but it's absolutely not the same. Right, I'm surprised they don't import them since we import everything else. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. There may be some, perhaps a, a, an African grocery store, a specialty kind right. of market, they may have them there. I will tell you, I've never seen a yam. In person, I've only seen them in, in photographs and on videos, um, but I would love to see what the difference in taste is. Um, you know, I've only kind of heard about that, but absolutely, the, the, I think it's so interesting that it was close enough that they knew how to prepare it and they knew what to do uh, with the sweet potato. I, I absolutely find that fascinating that those two things are so closely linked. Right. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Why are they grown here? Yams. So why aren't yams grown here? If, if there's none here, why aren't farmers growing them here? Can they grow here? So the climate, um, my understanding is the climate and the soil um, is not hot enough uh, for it to grow in the way that it would in, in West Africa. Um, and so I also think, quite frankly, there's probably not much money to be made in that because I think there's a very, this is my opinion, I don't know that part is true. I know about the soil and the heat, but I wonder, you know, if there are farmers who would grow that on a mass scale. Um, but my understanding is that the soil here is just not conducive in the way that it is in Africa. Hmm, interesting. Oh, yeah. 
Um, can you go back on your slides with the pictures mm -hmm. of the book with the soul food, the sure. cookbook? Sure, one second, let me share the screen again. Yeah, it's uh, soul food and Adrian Miller, he's a um, really great guy. He also has another book about barbecue if you're at all interested in learning about uh, this, the history of barbecue and how enslaved pitmasters really created the genre of barbecue, American, I, I want to be very clear, American barbecue uh, that we know today. That book is called Black Smoke. Uh, it's an incredible read. It has a lot of profiles of the early African-American pitmasters who worked throughout the South uh, and beyond. Um, it's, he's, it's a great, great read. And he also has a third book, uh, The President's Kitchen Cabinet. And it's about African-Americans who essentially fed the presidents in the White House and, and beyond. So uh, all three are really, really must reads in my opinion, if you have an interest in African-American foods. When he returned, oh. James Hemings, when he mm -hmm. went to Paris and learned the French cuisine, mm -hmm. did he then return and become Jefferson's chef? That's exactly right. So he comes back uh, from Paris and he works for, for Jefferson uh, for a few years. Uh, the reason he agreed to come back with Jefferson was that Jefferson essentially said, all right, so if you come back, you cook for me for a little while, I'll free you. And Jefferson was true to his word after I believe it was five years, I believe was what they agree upon. Uh, he did free, free Hemings. Um, and at that point, Hemings went to Baltimore, wound up being a cook in a tavern in Baltimore. And uh, although we're not exactly sure how he passed, uh, the general, you know, assumed assumptions that he drank himself to death. Some people say suicide, some people say um, alcohol poisoning, uh, but, you know, it, it's a it's a very tragic story because I imagine if you're trained in Paris and you're basically he trained under the, the tutelage um, of the chefs to the king, to the king of France. Um, so if you go from that to kind of cooking at a tavern in, in Baltimore, I imagine that must have been a very difficult transition for him. Yes, and I, I'm surprised because uh, as far as why didn't he just stay in um, France? He would have mm -hmm. been a free man, no? Or Yes, he I, would have been free. My, my theory is that his entire family was in Virginia okay. and, and Sally went back, was going back to Virginia. Um, and so my thought process is that he wanted to be with his family. Um, but but yes, I mean, I think that's the reasonable question because you're absolutely right. In France, he would have been free. He obviously had an occupation. He would be able to cook. He spoke French fluently. Um, so yeah, the only thing I keep coming back to is that his family, his family was here. Understandable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. These are such great questions. Yeah, I think about any other questions. Did you have one? No. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Deb, for joining us in Hop Hog. Yeah, thank no. You. Th thank you so much for having me. This was thank wonderful. You. Yes. Bye. We're yes, yeah. we're all very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. Watermelon in the back. And, and now we know what to serve on Juneteenth. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> So yeah, I, I will tell you that doing this work, you get hungry very often. Yes. <laughs> so I don't blame you. Know, a lot you. of us didn't realize, I mean, uh, we were just discussing amongst ourselves that we never really heard of Juneteenth until the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I find it amazing. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I just find it amazing, you know, that we never heard of it before. Like I said, the last couple of years, at least I haven't, you haven't either, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do think that it's interesting. I mean, you know, you guys are obviously up north. And so, you know, 
there are some celebrations there. I, you know, I know in Texas, it's, you know, it's a staple. I mean, there are thousands of people who go to different, you know, they're all over the state and, and beyond. And so it, I'm really glad to see that there's, well, one, that's become a national holiday. I think that's beautiful. And two, I think it's, it's really, really awesome that people from different cultures are learning more about Juneteenth and hearing about them, you know, better late than never, I suppose. But it's just really great because I think there are there's a lot to be learned from it. I think that there's you know there's a joy in this particular um, this particular holiday, and so I'm I'm just happy that folks want to know more about African American food and celebrations. It, it just it's absolutely thrilling. It makes me very happy. And we're going to look for those watermelons. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. If you can find an heirloom watermelon, whether, you know, it's the ones I mentioned or any of the others, then absolutely, absolutely get them. And so the key is, is that your seeds are typically going to be black. Seedless watermelons are not going to be heirloom watermelons. So if you're looking for something that's really good, if you're at a farmer's market or that sort of thing, ask the person if it's an heirloom and if there are seeds. And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, you're going to get a better, much, much better watermelon than if in the grocery store. Yeah, that I've heard. <laughs> much better tasting. They say the watermelons today are like pulp. There's nothing nothing to them. No, that's exactly right. I mean, I honestly, until I started writing about watermelons and trying different heirloom watermelons, I didn't really enjoy them because of that. They were either mushy or they were watery. They didn't have much of a taste. And so now that I've tried all of these different heirloom watermelons, I, I mean, it's, it's absolutely delicious. And it's, and also the thing that I also think about is that you're tasting history, right? So we taste, you know, kind of the Odell's white, for example, you're tasting something that someone cultivated, you know, hundreds of years ago. And if it's grown properly, it, it's going to be a very similar, if not the same taste. And so you're literally able to taste history. It's absolutely incredible. Well, you can even tell, I mean, from when I was a kid, the difference between watermelons when I was a child mm -hmm. compared to watermelons that I eat today. You know, yeah, I, yeah. It, it's night and day. It's literally night and day. And it's like, yeah, just I kind of want to scream because, you know, big agra, you know, not to get on a soapbox, but, you know, really they're bred for, you know, to be able to go from one side of the country to the other um, and, and not spoil. And they're bred for size and color, not taste. No, it's, it's just not grown for taste at all, which is really sad. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we're good. No more questions. Appreciate everything. Deb. All right. This was wonderful. wonderful. Thank, you. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. Enjoy Juneteenth. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all do the same. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.